The domain of a function is the set of all x values that we can plug into the function. It's where the function is defined. For example, what's the domain of 3x plus 1? This is a linear function. It looks like this. It's just a line that goes on forever. As you might expect then, the domain is all real numbers, which in interval notation looks like this. Everything from negative infinity to positive infinity. There's no x value you can plug into 3x plus 1 that causes a problem. Similarly, for a quadratic function like this one, 2x squared minus x plus 5, which looks like this, you can plug any real number you want in here. So the domain is everything from negative infinity to positive infinity. More generally, every polynomial function, here's one with degree 7, has a domain of all real numbers. Every polynomial function has a domain of all real numbers. Anything from negative infinity to positive infinity, you can plug in. And by the way, a function is a polynomial if it's created by adding and or subtracting powers of x, where those powers are non-negative integers, like 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. So finding the domain of polynomials is really easy. It's just all real numbers. The task becomes more difficult when we start to consider some problem functions. These are functions that do have domain restrictions, values of x that we can't plug into them. For example, division and the square root. If we've got a function with division, we need the denominator to not equal zero. And if we have a square root, we need the input of the square root to be non-negative. It needs to be greater than or equal to zero. I'm going to show you how to find the domains of these types of functions. You can see on screen now all the examples we're going to go over. I'll also show you how to write the domains in interval notation. For our first example, consider f of x equals 2x to the negative 1. What's the domain of this function? It kind of looks like a polynomial, so you might be tempted to say it's all real numbers, but as we can see from the graph, that's not true. There's very clearly an issue here, and that's because this is not a polynomial. Remember, in a polynomial, every power of x has to be non-negative, and it has to be an integer. This power is negative 1. 2x to the negative 1 is the same as 2 over x. These are just two different ways for writing the same thing. So clearly, when you have a negative power, what you're dealing with is division. So we do have a domain restriction. The restriction is that x can't equal 0. We cannot divide by 0. So if we want to draw our domain on a number line, we have an open circle at 0 because the domain doesn't include 0. But anything else is fair game. The division by zero is the only potential issue here. To write that in interval notation, we have an interval going from negative infinity to zero. We have parentheses on both ends because we're not including negative infinity, since it's not a number, and we're not including zero because we don't want a division by zero. And then we union this, that's a big U, with the interval that goes from zero to positive infinity. This is just all real numbers except zero. Zero. Next example, g of x equals 4 over x minus 5. Notice we're calling this function g. You can call your functions whatever you want. f and g are both common names. If we look at this function, what are the potential problems? Well, we have division and we can't divide by 0. So whatever we're dividing by must not equal 0 x minus 5 must not equal 0, and that means that x must not equal 5. You can just add 5 to both sides and get that. That's what we see in the graph. There's this asymptote at x equals 5. If we want to represent that on our number line, we can say 5 is maybe right about there, and we need an open circle because 5 is not included in the domain. Everything else, though, is perfectly fine, so we'll shade in the rest of the line. In interval notation, that looks just just like our previous domain where we had to cut out 0, the only difference, of course, is that now we have to cut out 5. So we'll go from negative infinity to 5, union that with the interval from 5 to infinity. These are called open intervals, by the way, because they're not including the endpoints. Next, h of x equals 2x plus 1 divided by x squared minus 8x plus 15. 
There's no issues in the numerator. That's just a linear function. You could plug anything you want in there. But we have a denominator. We have division. We can't divide by zero. So that denominator, x squared minus ax plus 15, must not equal zero. Now we treat this just like solving an equation in order to find what values of x we need to prohibit. So we'll factor the left side of this equation. We need two numbers that multiply to 15 and add to negative 8. 3 and 5 multiply to 15, but they add to positive 8. But if we make them negative, that'll work, because negative 3 times negative 5 is positive 15, and they add to negative 8. So we can factor the left side as x minus 3 times x minus 5, and we know that this must not equal 0. By the zero product property then, that means that x must not equal 3, because if it did, then this would be zero. And also, x must not equal five, because if it did, then that would be zero. Thus, we have two numbers we need to exclude from the domain, which you could see from the graph. Going to our number line, three is right there, so we'll put an open circle there, and five is there. Everything else is totally fine. So we'll draw an arrow going off to positive infinity, an arrow going off to negative infinity, and connect the space in between those gaps. In interval notation, this is similar to our previous examples, but slightly more complicated. We need to go from negative infinity to three, and we also need to go from five to positive infinity, but then we also need to get the space in between, which is from three to five. Next example, s of x equals three x plus one divided by x squared plus nine. Again, the only problem function here is the division. We can't divide by zero x squared plus 9 must not equal 0. And that means that x squared must not equal negative 9. However, x squared is never equal to negative 9. If you square 0, you get 0. If you square anything else, you get a positive number. You cannot square something and get a negative number. So actually, any value of x here is fine, which the graph suggests. We can see there's no gaps, there's no asymptotes. The domain here is actually all real numbers. On the number line, that would just mean that we're shading the entire thing. In interval notation, again, this is just everything from negative infinity to positive infinity. Next, f of x equals x to the one half. What's the domain of this? There's no division to worry about. Kind of looks like a polynomial, so maybe the domain is all reals, but it's not a polynomial. Remember, for a polynomial, the powers of x need to be non-negative integers. One half is not an integer. It's a fraction. It's not whole. This is actually the same as the square root of x. These are just two ways of writing the same thing. And we know you cannot take the square root of a negative number. The only restriction here is that x has to be non-negative. So for our domain, we can include zero. Zero is totally allowed, so we have a solid dot there. And then everything in the positive direction we can have as well. We just can't have negative. What that looks like in interval notation is a bracket with zero, because again, we can include zero, we can plug zero in this, and we go up to positive infinity. You can see that from the graph, x starts at zero and just goes off to positive infinity. Next example, f of x equals the square root of x minus two. Very similar idea. We cannot take the square root of a negative number. So whatever we're taking the square root of, in this case, it's x minus two, has to be non-negative, has to be greater than or equal to zero. Adding two to both sides of that inequality tells us that x has to be greater than or equal to two. So we'll put a solid dot at two because two is allowed and then we'll shade everything towards positive infinity. The domain here is a close bracket at two because we can include two and then go up to positive infinity. Again, that's reflected in the graph. Next, h of t equals the square root of t squared plus 10t minus 24. Just like we can change the name of our function, we can also change the independent variable. x is the most common choice, but t is another common choice. Doesn't really make a big difference. Again, we're taking a square root here. So what we take the square root of, which in this case is t squared plus 10t minus 24, must be greater than or equal 
to zero. We then want to solve for t to see what restrictions are placed on t, and we can do that by factoring the left side of the inequality. We need two numbers that multiply to negative 24 and add to 10. 2 and 12 multiply to 24. 2 and negative 12 multiply to negative 24. However, they add to negative 10. We need positive 12 and negative 2. Those add to 10 and multiply to negative 24. So we can factor the left side as t plus 12 and t minus 2. That's the left side, and it must be greater than or equal to 0. Now this is a little tricky. It's not as simple as just using the zero product property. We need this thing to be greater than or equal to 0. We know that it equals 0 based on our factorization. It equals 0 at t equals negative 12 and at t equals positive 2. So if this is 0, we know our function hits 0 at negative 12, and then it hits it again at 2. But we don't know what it's doing besides that. We got to figure out where is it positive and where is it negative. What parts do we need to exclude? Because wherever it's negative, well, we cannot have that. For this type of situation, a sign chart can be really useful. We just draw a line and put our two points on there where the function hits zero, negative 12 and two in this case. It doesn't matter how they're spaced out. We really just want to focus on the fact that there are these three intervals, everything to the left of negative 12, everything to the right of positive two, and everything in between. We need to see where is the function positive and where is it negative. To do that, just take a point from each interval and plug it into the domain and see what you get. For example, 0 is between negative 12 and 2. So let's take that point and plug it in to the function. If we plug 0 into the function, it's clear that we will just get negative 24, which means all the values between negative 12 and 2 are negative. Now what about this interval to the right of 2? We could plug in 3, for example. If we plug 3 in, we get 9 plus 30 minus 24, and that's positive. 30 minus 24 is 6, plus 9 is 15, so that means to the right of 2, the function is positive. Now, to the left of negative 12, we could choose negative 20, for example. That's a multiple of 10, so it will work nicely. And it will probably be easier if we plug it into the factored form of the function, which works just as well. If we plug negative 20 into this, we get negative 20 plus 12, which is negative 8, times negative 20 minus 2 which is negative 22. It's two negatives. They multiply to a positive. So all the values of our function to the left of negative 12 have to be positive. So by using sample points from each interval, we're able to fill out our sign chart to see where our function is positive and negative. In this case, we see it's negative between negative 12 and positive 2. That's the interval we need to restrict from our domain. So what is our domain? Well, it's everything except for that part, which means that we're going from negative infinity to negative 12, and we can include negative 12 because that makes the input zero, and the square root of zero is zero. That's no problem. And then we union that with everything from positive two. Again, we're including positive two because the square root of zero is just zero and that goes up to positive infinity. Notice we've completely excluded everything between negative 12 and 2. On our number line, it looks like that. Next, x of t equals 3t plus 4 divided by the square root of t plus 2. Notice our strange naming here. Instead of naming the function f, we've named it x, and instead of our independent variable being x, it's t. This could be like the horizontal position of something, its x position, as a function of time, just for an example. Regarding the domain, this has two potential problems. Not only do we have division, and so the square root of t plus 2 must not equal 0, but also we have the square root. The thing that we're taking the square root of, t plus 2, must be greater than or equal 
to zero. Focusing on the first restriction, the square root of t plus two is not equal to zero, we can square both sides to find that t plus two must not equal zero. And that means that t must not equal negative two. So that's our first restriction. The restriction from the square root is that t plus two must be at least zero, which means that t must be at least negative two. We then need to combine the two restrictions to make sure that we're satisfying everything. t can't equal negative two, and t needs to be at least negative two. In total, that means that t has to be greater than negative two. On the number line, that looks like this, an open circle at negative two, because we can't include it, but anything bigger than that we can include, so we just shade to the right. The domain is a parenthesis at negative two, and we're going up to positive infinity. We're back to normal names for this next example. f of x equals the square root of x minus nine divided by x squared minus 16. In this case, we have a square root in the numerator, so that forces the restriction that x minus nine must be at least zero. We can't take the square root of a negative. Quickly dealing with this, that means that x has to be at least nine. On the other hand, we also have division. We have division by x squared minus 16. That means x squared minus 16 must not equal zero, which means adding 16 to both sides, the x squared must not equal 16. Then taking the square root and remembering it could be positive or negative means that x can't equal positive or negative four. Remember, that's because not only does positive four squared equal 16, but also negative four squared equals 16. We then have to combine these two restrictions, x is at least nine and x is not equal to plus or negative four. In this case, the first restriction actually already forces the second restriction. So our total amount of restrictions is just that x has to be at least nine. If x is at least nine, it's certainly not plus or minus four. On our number line, that looks like this, a solid dot at nine because we can include it. And then everything greater than that, we can also include. In interval notation, we have a bracket for nine because we can include it, and we're going up to positive infinity. Finally, our last example, g of a equals the square root of a plus two divided by the square root of a squared minus nine. We've got a square root in the numerator, which forces the restriction a plus two has to be at least zero because we can't take the square root of a negative, and that means that a has to be at least negative two. Then we're dividing by the square root of a squared minus nine. So that thing we're dividing by, the square root of a squared minus nine, must not equal zero. Squaring both sides, that means that a squared minus nine must not equal zero. And then adding nine to both sides, we have that a squared must not equal nine, taking the square root and remembering the plus or minus. This means that a must not equal plus or minus three because both positive three and negative three square to give positive nine. But then there is one more restriction because remember this thing in the denominator is a square root. So the thing inside of it has to be non-negative. A squared minus nine has to be greater than or equal to zero, which means that a squared has to be greater than or equal to nine. And this leads to the somewhat strange restriction that a needs to be greater than or equal to three, because if you square three or something greater, you'll get something that's at least nine, or a needs to be less than or equal to negative three, because if you square negative three or anything less, you will again get something that is nine or bigger. For example, five squared is 25, that is at least nine. Negative seven squared is positive 49, which is at least nine. Now we need to add up all the domain restrictions to see what the final domain is that satisfies all requirements. We figured out that it's possible a is less than or equal to negative three, but one of the other restrictions was that a has to be at least negative two. So that completely eliminates the less than or equal to negative three. That can't be allowed because we also need to satisfy that. But then this restriction that a is at least negative two doesn't really matter either because we also have that a has to be at least positive three, which is a stronger requirement than a being at least negative two. We then also have that a can't be positive or negative three. 
course, it can't be negative 3 because it has to be at least 3. The fact that it can't equal positive 3, though, is an additional restriction. Our final restriction is that A is greater than 3. On the number line, of course, that's an open circle at 3 with a line going off to positive infinity. The domain is a parenthesis at 3 because we're not including 3 going off to positive infinity. And now you know how to find the domains of polynomials, radical functions, and rational functions. Those are the division ones. Remember, when you have division, you cannot divide by 0. Whatever you're dividing by, it can't equal 0. Whatever you take the square root of, that thing needs to be non-negative. You need to take these restrictions, figure out how they affect your independent variable, and if you have multiple requirements by the end of this process, make sure you carefully add them all up to see what your final domain is, which satisfies all restrictions.